affirmative. We now move on to matters of public importance. The question is that the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. McKim has submitted, Senator McKim submitted a proposal understanding Order 75. It is shown at item 15 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? With the con okay, so with the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will, clerks will now set the clock in line with the informal arrangements made by the whips, and I call Senator Faruqi. I rise to share the sentiments that so many people in Australia and around the world are feeling. Senator uh, Faruqi, would you mind moving the motion first? Um, I move the motion. Thank you. And I rise to share the sentiments that so many people in Australia and around the world are feeling. A dreadful fear. Fear about the climate crisis we are in. The fires, the extreme heat, the droughts, the floods, which worsen every single year. The globe isn't just warming up anymore, it is cooking, and we are in the era of global boiling. And yes, it is as terrifying as it sounds, with Antarctic ice the size of Western Australia missing this winter, July being the hottest month ever recorded, extreme fires and heat waves ravaging the Northern Hemisphere, and record Atlantic Ocean temperatures. The unambiguously apocalyptic climate warnings that scientists, the United Nations, the other experts and agencies have been sounding are actually being realized. There is also anger, a deep anger, at this government's arrogance and refusal to take the urgent and profound action needed in the midst of this absolute emergency. People are crying out for urgent action, for us to do so much better as a country on climate, to lead the world in climate action, and to fight with everything that we've got to give our planet and our children the chance of a livable future that they so deserve. Coal and gas are fueling this extreme climate crisis, and Australia is one of the biggest exporters of fossil fuels. And while the globe boils, what is Labour doing? Turning up the temperature by opening new coal and gas. They are making it worse with the Environment Minister Tanya Plibersek giving the tick of, of approval to three climate bombs just this year. That's right. Labour aren't just letting us carelessly coast along towards climate collapse. No, they are actively driving us there. If this insatiable appetite to dig up coal and gas continues, there are predictions that our planet could catastrophically warm by 1.5 degrees as early as 2027. That's just four years away, bringing on irreversible collapse of ecosystems. What we are seeing in the Northern Hemisphere now will hit Australia this summer. So why is Labour willfully ignoring all the signs, the code reds, the flashing lights, and the blaring sirens? Is it just a lack of courage, stopping them from taking the profound action that is needed? Unfortunately, it is worse than just a lack of foresight or courage. It's much more sinister. Labour knows full well the inadequacy of their responses, but they are so beholden to the climate wrecking, morally bankrupt fossil fuel corporations who fill their pockets with dirty donations that they don't care. The Labour Party are held to ransom by their buddies in big coal and gas, companies who, by the way, pay next to no tax and are using oppressive slap suits to silence activists alerting us to the climate emergency. They would rather the planet boil than stand up to these companies and risk their own coffers. Australia's coal and gas is causing climate disasters everywhere. It is our neighbours in the Pacific, indigenous peoples and people of colour in the global south who are on the front line, who will be most harmed by the climate crisis, but who have contributed the least to global emissions. They have been sounding the alarm as every international forum, at every international forum for decades. And yet, leaders of rich countries like Australia and the Global North have ignored their pleas for climate justice. I've just returned from Pakistan after seeing my Ami. Australia's criminal inaction on climate is deeply felt there, felt in the extreme heat, felt in the melting glaciers, washing away entire villages 
and felt in the everyday life of children in Pakistan who are suffocating in an ever deadly mix of intense heat and trapped pollution. So we must remember also to lift our gaze. We must start a process of making climate reparations to the global south countries who are most harmed by Australia's contribution to the climate crisis. This is not charity, but compensation for harms that Australia continues to directly cause and which Australia now has an opportunity to redress. It is time to take real action on climate. Labor must commit to an immediate end to native forest logging. The Prime Minister and Labor must stop approving new coal and gas projects and push the world to do the same. That's the kind of leadership we demand from Australia. Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, I've never heard a, a greater spray or screed of double standards in this place ever. I wasn't going to raise the Pakistan issue, but since Senator Faruqi has, uh, she might be interested to know, and I don't know if this came up in her discussions over there in the subcontinent, but that just six months ago, in February this year, less than six months ago in February this year, Reuters report, headline from Reuters, Pakistan plans to quadruple domestic coal-fired power and move away from gas. And then she has the temerity to come into this place and blame us and blame this country for this climate crisis while well, failing to mention, and surely she would know, I'm sure she would know, that Pakistan is turning on more coal-fired power stations Order, if they're going out of fashion. So how about we apply an equal standard here? Why are we so quick, or why are the Greens, I should say, so quick to damn Australia and our country and our people, and so quick, so quick to let off the hook, whether it's Pakistan, whether it's China, whether it's India, whether it's Europe, so quick, and I'll come to Europe, so quick to let them off the mark. The other broader double standard there in this contribution today is that we are constantly told, every time it's cold, we're constantly told the weather is not climate, the weather is not climate. And then as soon as it's hot in Rome, apparently the weather is climate. What a double standard. Because do the Greens even remember? Do they remember May? Only a few months ago in May, and I'm quoting here from a report in May, that more than 100 weather stations across Australia have registered their coldest May minimum temperatures on record. On record. Now, I'm not saying that's climate, but you are. You're saying that because it's a bit hot in Europe at the moment, it's global boiling now. Apparently, it's a term. Global warming is no longer useful, so they've come up with a new term to replace the old term to scare us even more. But they're just, they're just using weather, using data points to, to justify putting a massive new restrictions on our own economic restrictions when they're ignoring the data in our own country, which showed we just had the most, the, one of the most coldest Mays on record. Why do you ignore that? But it just, you just take into account that. It doesn't make, doesn't make any sense. Because what's actually happening around the world, not just Pakistan, what's actually happening around the world, a news flash to the Greens, is the world is actually increasing its use of coal and not Australia. We're getting blamed. The Greens constantly blame us. They want to blame our, their own country, apparently their own country. They want to blame their own people, yet ignore. Well, it's not from Australia, Senator Wishwell. So I'll take that investment, okay? I'll take that. Order, I'll take that. Senator, I'll take that uh, interjection Senator because Australia's called. coal production actually fell by 3 per cent in the past year. Whereas in China, it's up 6 per cent. In India, it's up 8 per cent. In Europe, Europe has increased their coal production by 1 per cent over the past year. We've actually declined our use. So if you actually looked at the data, the Greens looked at the data chair, they would actually see that Australia is not contributing to this issue. It's other countries that they refuse to condemn. Because as the International Energy Agency reported last week, they reported, they said, as projected in the coal 2022 report last December, global coal demand reached a new all-time high in 2022, rising above 8.3 billion tonnes. 8.3 billion tonnes. And I said, Australia's use over that year, Australia's production, I should say, actually fell by 3 per cent. But this new record was reached because other countries, China, Indonesia, India, are increasing their production of coal, increasing their reliance, even Europe, increasing their reliance on coal. And it should also be stated to get the facts right here. So the world uses 8,300 million tonnes of coal a year. Australia, its production declined a little bit. Australia's production is 450 million tonnes of that 8,300. So it's about 5.5 per cent. We produce about 5.5 per cent of the world's coal. So we're not the cause of all of these issues. And even if we were to completely shut down the coal industry here, as the Greens would want to do, it would make no difference to the climate at all. No difference at all because China, India, other countries would continue to mine their own coal. They need easily be able to increase their production to replace our coal. 
So what, 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 is the, what is this actually about, Madam Acting Deputy President? It's not really about the climate. It's not about that at all. It's not about that at all. They, they simply want to deindustrialise Western countries. That is the agenda here, because they're letting all the other countries off the hook. Never hear them speeches about Xi Jinping and his policy to build two coal-fired power stations a week. Never any condemnation of that. There's never any condemnation of India's plans to, to, to expand. They've achieved these plans to expand their coal production to over 1,000 million tonnes a year. They've achieved that in the past year. Never any condemnation of that. Never any condemnation of Pakistan and their plans to quadruple the number of coal-fired power stations in the country. If they really cared about the climate, they'd be mentioning those things as well. But what the Greens really care about is shutting down industry in Australia and shifting that wealth, redistributing that wealth to other countries. That is the agenda here, as plain as day, given the double standards that are constantly espoused by them from that corner. Senator Grogan. <clears throat> Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. Um, so here we are again um, with our three corner jack conversation around climate, energy and the future of Australia. Um, I don't think it's going to surprise anyone in here to advise you that Labor will not be supporting this motion because we will not be supporting a motion that has a blanket moratorium. Rather, we will be transitioning Australia to a clean, sustainable energy future because the extremities of all and the extremities of nothing are not going to give us a strong economy and a safe country and an opportunity to do everything that we can to transition to that. So rather than um, pointing fingers at what everybody else might have done, I thought I would just take the opportunity, given the debates we've had so far today on this, to just talk about what we have done what we have done in 12 months and where we think that's going to take us. So we do know that natural disasters are increasingly frequent and increasingly unnatural. How many times have you heard somebody say, oh, that's our second 100-year flood in 10 years? The times have changed. These 100-year floods, 100-year fires, that's not how it's moving anymore. Things are changing. It is a crisis. We need to take action. Obviously, there's a lot of disagreement about what that action should look like. But we will take action. And we have taken significant action in just 14 months that Labor has been in government. So our major focus in coming into government was to lock in a policy environment that was going to drive our climate and energy priorities, which we've been really clear about for a number of years. We wanted to create a policy certainty for business and encourage investment because the kind of change we're looking at is going to take a lot of people, everybody pulling in the same direction and putting ourselves out there as an investment certainty, as a good opportunity for investment helps drive that development quicker, helps drive that process towards a more renewable energy base quicker. And then we went about rebuilding the relationships internationally and with our states so that we could actually get those connectivity that we've, we've heard some talk about already in terms of internationally and who's doing what to who, when and how. Um, and I will take the point to say I think that um, the commentary about us being responsible for a country who's got much more robust action going on in a negative sense, that we're responsible for that, is, is kind of out of line. Um, and, ours, uh, and the negotiation with the states and the rebuilding of the relationship with the states, so that those issues that are shared responsibilities or are connected responsibilities are things that we can then get traction on. And we have seen the fruits of that hard work of Minister Bowen. Um, so we set our emissions reduction target of 43% by 2030 and net zero by 2050. We committed to 82% renewable energy by 2030. We have um, given the safeguard mechanisms teeth so that <laughs> the biggest emitters will need a net emission reduction of almost 5% per year every year. We had the Chubb review to verify the carbon credits and make some changes. Um, We've got emissions reductions finally in the, energy, um, the national energy objectives so that our regulators and our operators are actually using that as a baseline for decision making and for setting the rules in our energy market. We've got the Climate Change Authority back 
to play a real and meaningful role. We have put net zero in the objectives of the CEFC and the ARENA Act and made it relevant to other key agencies that are playing in this space, namely Infrastructure Australia and Export Finance Australia. We are upgrading and expanding our power grid with $20 billion in rewiring the nation to increase the grid security and to drive down power prices and unlock new renewables. We finalised the law for offshore wind. Um, we have released our national uh, electric vehicle strategy, which comes with fuel efficiency standards, electrical vehicle discounts, which we've seen actually work. We're seeing movement. We are seeing significant changes. And there is not enough time in the five minutes I've been given to list all the things that we have done. But we are working so hard to make sure that Australia is a sustainable, you, clean Brogan. energy future. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Two minutes. We face a terrifying uh, outlook when it comes to climate, with Antarctic sea ice the size of Western Australia missing this winter. We've seen the hottest global month ever recorded, extreme fires and heat waves across the Northern Hemisphere, and record Atlantic Ocean temperatures. The UN Secretary General has declared that the world is boiling. Uh, the urgency of this escalating crisis requires urgent and profound action from all global leaders, including Australia's Labor government, that must commit to no new coal and gas and an, an immediate end to native forest logging. I commend this motion from the Greens. 21 of the 30 hottest days ever recorded occurred this month. 2023 will likely be the hottest year in history by a considerable margin. The coming El Nino system is likely to push temperatures even higher and may make 2023 or 2024 the warmest year yet recorded. We're seeing the result of inaction. It is horrifying. We have to listen to scientists. We have a government that says that they accept the science. They just won't listen to scientists. They've been clear. They won't even listen to the International Energy Agency. Apparently their plan is better. And their plan includes fracking the Beetaloo, opening up so many big gas projects. <laughs> Scarborough, Barossa, Pluto. You can, you can, it's a long, long list. As well as approving the extension of coal in 2023. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Wish Wilson. 90 per cent of global warming, or as the UN General Secretary now describes, global boiling, is stored in our oceans. With an unprecedented heat wave in our northern hemisphere still unfolding, with records being broken every day, with July set to break the record for the warmest month in human history, currently an unprecedented 44 per cent of our global ocean is experiencing marine heat waves right now, compared to an average of 10 per cent. The warmest ocean temperatures ever recorded in the North Atlantic, the same in the Mediterranean, and officially the warmest ocean temperature ever recorded anywhere on the planet was in Florida, off the coast last week at 38 degrees Celsius, warm as a hot bath. As our oceans, reefs and corals that support a quarter of our Earth's marine biodiversity are in danger. Our own global natural wonder, the Great Barrier Reef, also recorded its own marine heat wave warning for the end of June. Over one million square kilometres of the Great Barrier Reef for 2,000 kilometres above average. Worrying, considering it's not even summer yet, let alone almost certainly an El Nino summer to come. Coral bleaching poses the single biggest existential threat to reefs and marine biodiversity around the world. Of course, with such global boiling occurring on land and sea, this will impact ice levels on our planet. Disappearing ice in the North and Arctic has long been a source of concern. Now it's also in the Antarctic. An unprecedented ice mass the size of Western Australia or Mexico is missing 
off Antarctic compared to previous years. Scientists are baffled at the size of the change. To use your own words, they are gobsmacked. It is estimated this once in a 7.5 million year event is almost certainly due to global warming. Loss of sea ice can accelerate ocean warming, alter ocean currents globally and ultimately raise sea levels and will have significant <coughs> biodiversity impacts on krill and other marine creatures. So at such a time in human history where we are likely facing a climate tipping point, can you believe that the Australian Antarctic Division that does our critical scientific work in the great barometer of the world's weather and climate is facing budget cuts. Uh, 15 per we learnt last week that the Australian Antarctic Division is having to cut their operating budget by 16 per cent to find $25 million in savings. We have heard from many sources that many scientific programs planned for this summer, including studies of sea ice, have been canned because of this budget cut. How did this happen? There has never been a worse time for our globally significant and critical Antarctic Science Division to be facing such cuts. This government needs to commit, especially at such a critical juncture, to prioritising Antarctic science programs. That will be critical to understanding the pace of change we are seeing in the climate and what we can do about this. But most importantly, it needs to stop approving new coal and gas mines. Three coal mines in 53 days. That's Labor's current response to this accelerating climate crisis. And I didn't know, did note last week that when this new data came out about Antarctic sea ice, uh, not a word, not a word from the Prime Minister or any minister uh, in this government. It's simply criminal to ignore the climate breakdown we are seeing around us and continue to pour petrol on the fire. And in my last 16 seconds, um, I'm an optimistic guy, acting Deputy President, but I really hope Senator Canavan might have actually opened his eyes uh, and taken his head out of his arse and uh, noticed Senator, that Senator his Wish planet Wilson. Senator is Wish changing. Wilson. Senator, uh, Senator Wish Wilson, I'd ask you to withdraw that reflection on Senator Canavan. Uh, I'll withdraw the word us and uh, You should withdraw with un unconditionally, Senator Wish Wilson. I'll withdraw. Thank President. you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Acting Deputy Madam President. In, in the first part of this year, I've spent a lot of time with Australians hearing how they have dealt with natural disasters. I've had this privilege because I am chairing the Disaster Resilience Committee. Unlike a lot of inquiries in this place, this one looks forward, not back. We know extreme climate events are getting worse and what everyday families are having to cope with, it is just plain awful on what we are hearing. Between the floods and the fire, the message I've been getting is loud and clear, is that without the Australian Defence Force being called in, we are in a great world of hurt. And that is without them being in a place of war. So right now we are very privileged to be able to use them. But I've got a problem. The ADF is already stretching what happens when they, don't, when they aren't here. Our SES and fireys are also massively stretched. They're, so, they're getting older and the generation down, like me, are not signing up to volunteer. Everyone from the UN to the top investment managers are saying we need to be on war footing to cope with these extreme weather events. I can assure you something needs to be done. I'm calling for volunteers. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator Lambie. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy uh, President. This July has been the hottest global month ever recorded. The climate crisis is happening now. Antarctic sea ice the size of Western Australia has gone missing this winter. The Northern Hemisphere in July saw extreme fires and heat waves and record Atlantic Ocean temperatures. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres says that we've left the era of global warming and we've entered the era of global boiling. He's called for dramatic immediate climate action. He's previously called for developed countries like Australia to get out of coal, oil and gas. The time to act if we're going to keep global heating below catastrophic levels must be now. And yet, the Albanese government continues to approve new fossil fuel projects, putting our climate and our environment and our very humanity at risk. Environment uh, assets, including the Great Barrier Reef, which is one of the seven natural wonders of the world and supports countless miraculous species of creatures and corals and plants, 
and provides a livelihood for 60,000 workers in my state of Queensland and a revenue pre-COVID of almost $6 billion a year. Recurrent bleaching as a result of the climate crisis has already changed global reefs forever. More than half the coral cover of the Great Barrier Reef has been permanently lost in successive mass coral bleaching since 2015. Because of that bleaching and the mass industrialisation of the reef with export ports to ship out yet more coal and gas to the world, the World Heritage Committee put the reef on the watch list for in danger listening. And the time for our country's homework to be remarked by that committee is nigh. It could even happen as early as tonight. Professor Terry Hughes tweeted today, the Prime Minister has rejected any moratorium on new coal and gas plants. Plibersek, Minister Plibersek has already approved three new coal uh, mines in two months. Does UNESCO seriously think Australia is doing all it can to safeguard the Great Barrier Reef's world heritage values? Well, with the Al Albanese government continuing to expand fossil fuels, it's hard to imagine how an in danger listing for our Great Barrier Reef can be avoided again. But then again, maybe Australia can bribe our way out of such a listing like we did last time with a global lobbying effort, more effort than that spent on actually addressing the climate crisis. Three coal mines in two months. And meanwhile, in a totally unrelated coincidence, fossil fuel companies have donated $2 million to the Labor parties, the Liberal parties and the National parties in just the last financial year. We need to ban fossil fuel donations. We need to make sure that coal and gas projects are made based on the science and not political interests. There can be no new coal and gas. None of those 114 <coughs> coal and gas projects can proceed if we are to have any hope of staying within livable parameters. <coughs> Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Roberts. I thank Senator McKim for his matter of urgency. The public is waking up to the net zero war on living standards, war on freedom of movement and war on property rights. Following public sentiment moving away from global warming ideology, the media is seeking to restore its credibility on this issue. So what's a climate carpetbagger like UN head Antonio Guterres got to do? Does he admit the scam is over and resign? No, he dialed up the hyperbole from global warming to global boiling. This hyperbole is dangerous. It's based on falsification of data. It's scaring children into thinking they have no future. It's destroying wealth and property. It's, destroying, it's taking away basic human rights like the right to travel and the right to enjoy one's own property. The warmers are desperate to save their scare from the reality of cooling temperatures Order. and the demonstrated failure of wind and solar to provide baseload power, while driving skyrocketing unaffordable power prices, crippling families. In tomorrow's adjournment speech, I'll be saying a lot more. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator McKim. The next exciting... uh, thanks, um, <clears throat> Acting Deputy President. Well, this planet has just experienced the three hottest days on record. This month, July, will be the hottest month on record. The Antarctic ice sheet is 15 per cent smaller than it should be. An area the size of Mexico or Western Australia has failed to freeze this winter. There are record North Atlantic Ocean temperatures. The actual Gulf Stream is flickering. It's turning on and off. Wildfires are ripping through southern Europe as we speak. The planet is literally cooking. We are living through the early days of the climate catastrophe and the feedback loops are kicking in. I'm usually an optimistic person, but I, I, I just want to say, mate, you can shut your mouth. Uh, Senator you can Senator, shut your Senator mouth. McKim, People Senator are McKim, dying Senator McKim, resume your seat. and sociopaths like you. Senator McKim, resume your seat. I don't. Senator McKim, order, order. I have a number of senators on their feet. I don't really need you to be on your feet for me to say, Senator Canavan, that you, Senator Canavan. Senator McKim, Senator McKim, order, order. This is disgraceful behaviour in the chamber. It is disgraceful. Now, Senator McKim, I ask you to withdraw your comments about Senator Canavan and resume your speech. And Senator Canavan, I ask that you cease interjecting across the chamber. Senator McKim. I withdraw, and I'm not going to cop 
interjections from sociopaths like Senator Canavan. Senator I McKim, will resume not your seat. Out. Resume your seat. Resume your seat. Senator McKenzie. Uh, point of order, I'll just ask uh, Senator McKim to withdraw that very unparliamentary reflection on another senator. Uh, Senator McKim, I asked you to withdraw, and I ask you again to withdraw and just continue your comments through me. Through I the will chair. withdraw, and I will say through you, Chair, that the sociopaths who run fossil fuel corporations on this planet, who are literally destroying the lives and the futures of billions of people and their sociopathic agents in this chamber and in the other place in this parliament have got a lot to answer for. And what they've got to answer for is death, disease, displacement, starvation, people dying of thirst, arable farming lands turning into desert and most likely billions of people dead by the end of this century Order, Senator, and the Canada. collapse of the ecosystems that actually support all human life on this planet. That's what people like Senator Canavan have got to answer for. And he can sit there and smirk and laugh about it as much as he likes, but history will regard what he has said and done in this place as an utter disgrace. This paradisical planet, this beautiful beautiful planet, this complex, Order. awesome web of life is dying. It's dying. And what is it going to take for people like him, for people like the Labor Party, for people like the opposition in this place, what is it going to take for them to act? How many people are going to have to die? before you will divorce, yourself, divorce yourselves from the sociopaths running fossil fuel and forestry corporations. Thank you, Senator McKim. Order in the chamber. Order in the chamber. Order. I call Senator Shoebridge. We are living through the opening scenes of a disaster movie right now, the hottest month ever recorded. Global ocean currents collapsing, Antarctic sea ice missing fires across Europe and North America. And the villains are there too. The billionaires accumulating ever more wealth, no matter the human and environmental costs. The politicians saying we can't afford climate action, while shoveling public money at rapacious fossil fuel companies. The media outlets telling people the climate solutions include getting used to the heat. In the context of global boiling, no new coal and gas is the essential first step. When the situation is this bad, not making it worse is hardly bloody radical. It's the bare minimum. Our children can't afford the cost of another dirty coal mine or another stinking gas field. They can't afford the greed of fossil fuel corporations. They can't afford a weak government. No new coal, Thank no you. new Thank you, gas. Senator Shoebridge. The question before the chamber is that the motion moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Can senators please cease their interjections while the bells are ringing?
lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim, teller for the ayes, and Senator Cadell, teller for the noes. Senator Green. The result of the division is ayes 9, noes 27. The question is resolved in the negative.